Hello, this is your host Kevin. Uh, Thank you for joining me for another episode of Can't Make This Up. Uh, I hope that wherever you're listening to this from around the world, uh, I hope that you have had a great summer. Uh, I know it's been about a month since uh, I posted anything. Um, Been doing a little bit of traveling over the the last few weeks. Um, My wife had surgery a few weeks back and had to recover from that, so that kind of put a a little damper on things. But uh, got the chance to go check out a little bit of western and northern Michigan. Uh, Went to Grand Haven, uh, enjoyed the beach on Lake Michigan, uh, went to Ludington State Park, uh, explored kind of the, the trails and the sand dunes there. I went up the Sleeping Bear Dunes uh, National Park, uh, National Lakeshore to be exact. Uh, beautiful place, beautiful part of our country to check out. Uh, highly recommend it if you ever get the chance. Uh, and I got to explore some history too. There's some lighthouses around there that I found really interesting. Uh, went to Big Sobble Point Lighthouse. Uh, near Ludington, a uh, bit of a bit of a hike to get there, but but well worth it. Uh, and then got to go to Old Mission Point Lighthouse, uh, a little bit further north. Um, they have some great history there. Got to learn about the lighthouse keepers, uh, which was really cool. Uh, one funny coincidence is that uh, when I was in the gift shop at the lighthouse, uh, I saw a, a book, uh, Brilliant Beacons by today's guest. Uh, so kind of a cool coincidence there. Um, one thing I'd like to say, uh, if you've been listening to the show for a while, uh, thank you very much. This is the show's fourth birthday. Been doing this for four years now. Uh, so some of you are new, some of you've been around since the very beginning. Uh, and I just want to say thank you very much. I appreciate you guys so much. Uh, and it's a lot of fun to be able to do this, uh, to be able to talk to really cool historians and authors and, and learn some new things. Um, I like it a lot. So thank you very much for you guys' support. Um, and so hopefully we'll be doing this again, uh, for four more years. All right. So today's guest, uh, again, if you've been around a while, uh, you've, you've seen him on here before. Uh, his name's Eric J. Dolan. Uh, he is a historian that specializes in maritime history. Uh, he's been here before to talk about pirates and the history of hurricanes in the United States. Uh, And today he joins me to talk about uh, privateering during the American Revolution. His most recent book is called Rebels at Sea, Privateering in the American Revolution. So if you get geeked out about naval history or if you're really into the American Revolutionary War period, uh, this episode is for you. Uh, So without further ado, here's my conversation with Eric J. Dolan. Hi, Eric. Welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Kevin. Thanks for having me back. This is great. Yeah. Um, I think this is your third time here. I think you're right. (laughs) Um, Well, uh, for uh, people who uh, uh, this might be their first time hearing you uh, on on this show, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your kind of niche in history where you like to write? Sure. Uh, Well, I live in Marblehead, Massachusetts, and that's where I'm talking to you from. I've been a full-time writer since 2007, but I started writing books before that. Uh, when I had a full-time, couple of different full-time jobs, I wrote early in the morning, late at night, and on weekends, and uh, I had this dream of being a full-time writer, and it took quite a few years to save up enough money to convince my wife that I could make the leap to full-time <laughs> writing, and that, that happened right there. <laughs> yeah, that that happened in 2007, and I've written a total of, including this book, Rebels at Sea, uh, 15 books, and uh, most of my books, all of my books, are on American history, some aspect of it. They range over a variety of topics. A, a lot of them have a natural history component, especially my earlier books. I wrote a book on the cleanup of Boston Harbor. I wrote a book on the 100th anniversary of the National Wildlife Refuge System and the history of the National Wildlife Refuge System. I wrote a book on whaling history. I wrote a book on the fur trade called Fur, Fortune, and Empire. Mm-hmm. Um, I wrote a book, Brilliant Beacons on Lighthouses, Black Flags, Blue Waters on Pirates, uh, When America First Met China on the 
China trade. Uh, my last book before Rebels at Sea was on a was called The Furious Sky, the 500 year history of America's hurricanes. So I sort of bounce around to different topics. If I had to pigeonhole myself, which the publishing world and readers often like to do, you sort of get known for something. I guess more than anything, now I'm known as a maritime historian, since an awful lot of my books have a maritime component. And, and that's mm -hmm. fine with me. I, I live in Marblehead, which is right on the edge of the ocean. Uh, my house is not right on the, the beach. Uh, writers don't make that kind of money. Uh, but I'm about a quarter of a mile from the water. And I usually see the ocean almost every day. And I love the ocean. I'm not a sailor, although I've been on sailboats and motorboats. Uh, I've spent a lot of time on the edge of the ocean. Uh, when I was younger, I wanted to be a malacologist. I wanted to study seashells. And I have an undergraduate master's and PhD, but not in history. Uh, they're in biology and environmental policy. And although I won't go through all the details because they're long and sorted, if you ever looked at my resume after both in between my graduate schools and, uh, and, and since before I jumped to being a full-time writer, I had a lot of different jobs. I sort of bounced around a lot, uh, part, partly because I got bored and I wanted to try something new. And uh, then my last couple of jobs, I just knew I wanted to be a writer. So I was trying as hard as possible to sock away some money so I could make the leap. So for those people listening who want to be writers, it's, it's possible. But uh, the key ingredients to being a full-time writer, as far as I can tell, unless you're independently wealthy, which I am not, uh, the key ingredients are being relatively frugal, wisely using your money, saving money, and most important, have a supportive spouse. And in my case, have a wife who's not only supportive, but has always earned a lot more money than I have. So that's the combination that you need to be a writer, <laughs> a full-time writer. Maybe a good dose of patience. <laughs> yeah, patience. So yeah, it took I remember it was in 1999 that I told Jen that I wanted to be a writer and she she's very supportive and she basically said that I had to put put aside a year's worth of my salary uh, before I could try to make a leap to writing full time and from 1999 it took until 2007 for me to sock away that money and then one night in the summer of 2007 after Leviathan the history of whaling had come out and done quite well uh, my, my wife turned to me and said, you can quit your job. And, uh, and I did a couple of weeks, uh, later, it was, uh, it was straight a strange experience for me going from a steady, consistent, good paycheck to the variable life of a writer. But I'm proud to say that that year's worth of my salary is still sitting untouched in a, its own little bank account waiting for that rainy day when I fail as a writer, <laughs> we need to draw on it. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, and, and if any uh, listeners want to check out, uh, you know, the past couple of times you've been on, uh, those ones were for uh, Black Flags and Blue Waters and uh, Furious Sky, where we had some great conversations about pirates and then, and then hurricanes. <laughs> great. But, all right, so, so this time, uh, again, kind of continuing your, your maritime theme, uh, you decided to take a look at uh, privateering in the American Revolution. Uh, your, your book is Rebels at Sea. Um, so I guess the, the first question is maybe a, maybe a dumb question, but uh, what's a privateer? <laughs> Not a dumb question at all. <clears throat> uh, privateers are armed vessels that were owned and outfitted by private individuals, and they had government permission to attack enemy ships during times of war. That permission came in something, a document called the Letter of Mark, which was an uh, official government document that was filled out depending on the name of the privateer and its complement and number of guns it had on board. And it sort of outlined the rules of the road, the responsibilities of the, the privateer and the privateersmen that were on board. And the key thing about privateering, it sort of was viewed as a free navy or militia of the sea, basically merchant 
uh, merchants who owned ships or uh, fishing captains who had their own vessels could turn their vessels into privateers by getting this letter of mark. And then they had the uh, option, not the option, they, the, the goal was to go out and attack British ships, mainly British merchant ships, or ships of other countries carrying munitions to the British Army or the Royal Navy. And once you capture those prizes, as they're called, or the spoils of war, you bring them back into port and you sell them if they're determined to be a valid prize. There was a legal process that was gone through for most of these captures. And uh, if it was determined to be a valid prize, then there was an auction held and the ship was uh, put up for sale or the ship could be used by the privateer's owner to send out as another privateer. But almost always the cargo on board the ship that was captured would be sold and the profits from the auction would be split 50 50 uh, half going to the owners and the investors in the privateer and there was sort of a speculative frenzy a lot of people invested took out shares in privateers hoping to hit it rich and the other 50 percent of the whatever was achieved at the auction would go to the privateersmen, the captain the first mate the other people lower down the totem pole on the privateer who did the, the fighting and the capturing. So there was a clear profit incentive to become a privateer. But as I argue very strenuously in the book, uh, most privateersmen were just as patriotic as their fellow Americans and uh, were not just in it for the profits, but they were also they also had patriotic motives. So that's basically what a privateer and privateersmen, that's, that's the definition. There were, there were two kinds of privateers, however. Uh, there were straight privateers that just went out to capture British ships. And then there were letter of mark privateers. Both of them got letters of mark, but the other ones were called letter of mark privateers. And they were commercial ships that could trade. So they would have cargo that they'd wanna to go to a distant port and trade. However, they also were armed. And if they came across a British ship that they thought they could take, as a prize, they had legal permission to do so. But most of the British ships that were captured during the American Revolution by privateers were captured by quote unquote straight privateers that were only looking for British prey. And, and this was like one of the largest industries. That was their primary, that was their primary was mission the going out. Primary goal. And privateering, you have to keep in mind, and the reason it got me, and I was very interested in writing about it, Privateering had a major impact on the outcome of the war. I think that it definitely contributed to our success in the American Revolution. There were nearly 2,000 privateering vessels and probably 20 to 30,000 men on board those privateers. And they captured nearly 2,000 British ships. And wow. they caused a lot of pain to uh, Britain. They not only caused insurance rates uh, on British ships to rise, they forced the Royal Navy to convoy British merchant ships and also to pursue American privateers. They played a starring role in bringing France into the war on the side of the Americans by increasing the irritation between France and Britain for a number of reasons. But one of the most important things that privateers did is they brought their cargo back into the colonies. And during the American Revolution, there was a lot of privation going on in the colonies because Britain had clamped down on our maritime commerce. So the people were in need of a lot of goods and the cargoes of these prizes included everything from rum and wine to flour and cordage and sails and beef and pork and flour. I mean, everything that you might need to, to live and prosper that came in and was sold at these auctions and filtered into the American economy. And also in many instances helped the British, helped the American army and the Continental Navy, because some privateers brought in gunpowder, a lot of privateers brought in cannons and uh, muskets and that could be used. And they also sometimes brought in specie, you know, hard currency, which was of great value in the colonies at a time when continental currency was increasingly worth less and less. So privateers had a, had a big impact. They were, well, contemporary during the war, wrote to the Continental Congress, a guy from Philadelphia, and basically said, without the goods that privateers brought in, I don't know how we could have survived 
the war effort. So in all those different ways, privateers influence the outcome. And to really understand it, and again, I go into this in great depth in the book, the American Revolution was a tenuous thing all along. There are many instances at which it could have gone in a different direction and we might have lost. In fact, if the British hadn't been so arrogant at the outset and assumed that Americans were just a rabble in arms and pursued the war more aggressively, I think Britain would have won in short order. But luckily we were able to hold on and uh, there, there wasn't one reason why we won the American Revolution, not even George Washington. There were many, many factors that played a role and my argument is that privateering was one of the most significant factors that contributed to our success. So kind of a follow-up question here um, that's uh, submitted by a, a, a listener, actually. Um, uh, supporters of the podcast can, can send questions in advance. Uh, and uh, uh, Bethany in, in Ohio here uh, okay. asked a question. Um, so how is a privateer any different than a pirate? Ha, good question. Well, uh, and you wrote part of the problem. Pirates, so you, you know that. No, 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 I wrote about pirates and Black Flags, Blue Waters talks about privateering. And in fact, it talks about an era uh, in the late 1600s, early 1700s, when many privateers were in fact nothing more than pirates. And going back to the, uh, the 13th century, when privateering first became a thing used by European powers, there have been many times when vessels that have been issued and individuals that have been issued letters of mark did not go out and attack enemy ships during times of war, but went out and attacked enemy ships or ships of a country that their rulers didn't like when they were at peace, which is not the definition of privateering. That's just out and out piracy. And the best example of that in America's history, which I talked about at great length in Black Flags, Blue Waters, is in during King William's War in the late 1600s, England was at war with France. And England, who was very well practiced in the art of issuing uh, privateering licenses, sent out a bunch of privateers to go attack French ships. Well, in the colonies, a lot of colonial governors, which were also English at the time, of course, uh, sold privateering licenses, sold letters of mark for roughly 300 pounds a pop to individuals who wanted to send out armed ships. And even though those armed ships by the terms of the letter of mark were supposed to attack French ships, the ones that Britain or England was at war with, they didn't. They went around the Cape of Good Hope into the Indian Ocean and they attacked uh, Mughal ships transiting between India and the Red Sea ports of Jeddah and Mocha, which had a lot of riches on board. And then they brought the booty back to the colonies. And once again, the local colonial governors, their palms were greased because each pirate usually had to pay 100 pieces of eight uh, to the governor to basically have permission to come into port without being molested by the local police or sheriff. Because you have to keep in mind, piracy, which is what they were doing, engaged in, was illegal in England. And the Crown and the Parliament were really upset at what was going on in the colonies, but they weren't very effective at clamping down on it. So back then, privateers, those privateers were nothing more than pirates. And this sort of dark history where a lot of privateers were, in fact, pirates in any, everything but name, uh, gave privateering a bad cast. Now, mm -hmm. when we get to the American Revolution, it's a different story. By that time, the rules and regulations for privateering were very well codified. The Americans who were issued letters of mark acted as privateers. In almost every case, they attacked British shipping or ships carrying British munitions. Uh, they followed the rules. They didn't treat their prisoners horrifically, which is one of the things you were supposed to treat prisoners with, you know, treat them well until they were brought into port. Uh, you're also supposed to bring your prize into port and have it adjudicated instead of selling it on the side for yourself and just taking it, pocketing all the money. And they usually brought them into port. And so by and large, privateers during the American Revolution abided by their letters of mark. They attacked the enemies of the United States at the time or the states and the colonies, which was Britain. And they were acting 
in fact, as privateers should act. So that's a distinction. Now, some people may say, oh, it's still licensed piracy. I think there's a distinction there. I think there's a different way of looking at it. You may not like privateering. That's a different question. You may think that nobody should be privateering and all wars, even back then, should have been left to official uh, navies and armies. Well, that's a different question. Mm -hmm. But the privateers during the American Revolution acted as privateers were supposed to, according to international law and the law of nations as practiced in Europe well before the American Revolution. And if it hadn't been for so many privateers in the past, like Sir Francis Drake and others acting like pirates, I think fewer people would automatically assume that privateers are the equivalent of pirates and that privateering is legalized piracy. So that's, that's the difference. But I'll, I'll add one last thing. Even if you're not convinced by that argument and you think privateers during the American Revolution were just legal pirates or were pirates, that doesn't matter. They still had a positive impact on the outcome of the war. And that's really what I looked at. What you want to call them, uh, that's fine. We're not going to go back and change history. Just because you call them pirates doesn't change what they did on the ground or on the ocean in that case. So there are multiple ways to look at it. I don't think they were pirates. They were privateers. Uh, and you really get the sense from looking at your book that they that they fill a gap for a nation that really doesn't have a navy. Yeah, I mean, well, think about it. <laughs> I mean, the Continental Congress was a, a weak form of government. They basically were overseeing 12, 13 na uh, sort of nation states or colonies that considered themselves very separate, not part of not really part of a unified group. Continental Congress could not levy taxes, so it had a difficult time raising money. It had to borrow from France and, and rich individuals within the colonies and other places, get loans from the Dutch and whoever they could. So it was kind of a dicey proposition to begin with. And if you had a well-functioning government that was had coffers that were full of, of cash, they would still have a hard time creating a navy from nothing. Mm -hmm. Well, for the Continental Congress, it was almost an insurmountable task. And the Navy, uh, the Continental Navy came to life haltingly. They still managed to pull together a Navy of about 60 ships. A couple of them, small number were actually built. But even the built ships were created a problem because they had to be built so fast that the wood didn't have enough time to be properly cured. So it was a little bit green. So the seams of the ships were not as tight as they should have been. And some of the ships leaked when they went out of port. Other ships that were trans, uh, transformed merchant ships or loaned by France, uh, about 28 of the Continental Navy's 60 ships were you know, either captured, sunk, or burned, in many cases, by the Americans to keep them from falling into the hands of the British. By 17, the end of 1780 and 1781, there were only a couple of naval ships left. And uh, John Adams, who was a big fan of the Navy and was very instrumental in getting it off the ground, he was also a big fan of privateering. Uh, around 1780, late 1780, John Adams said that uh, when you go over the history of the Continental Navy, it's hard to avoid tears. I mean, it basically made him cry to think what, what had happened. And even with that, even though the Navy had a limited impact, I mean, it did have some bright spots. They did a good job of ferrying diplomats across the Atlantic. They did capture some munitions depots and brought armaments and gunpowder back to the colonies. And there, of course, is the famous battle, John Paul Jones in his naval ship, the Bonhomme Richard, uh, defeated the Royal Navy ship Serapis. But even that was a Pyrrhic victory because uh, Jones lost more than 100 men and the Bonhomme Richard sank to the bottom of the ocean and he had to transfer his men to the Serapis, which was not in much better shape. And actually the whole purpose that Jones had in this voyage was to attack the, uh, the merchant ships that were being convoyed by the Serapis and a couple of other military ships, but that convoy that was Jones's target got away during the fighting. So it was kind of a Pyrrhic victory. So, um, you know, this was the Navy's first hour. It wasn't its finest hour. But as I said, they had some bright spots. But it's really when you look at 
the revolution in that context that our Continental Navy had a limited impact, that's where the value of privateering really becomes evident because privateers were a quickly pulled together free Navy essentially, and they filled the void that uh, the actual Navy could not uh, uh, perform that, that task. And in came the privateers. And the other way to think about it is the Continental Navy ships, they spent most of their time when they were attacking British ships, attacking British merchant ships, not British warships. They couldn't stand up to a ship of the line or a 64-gun frigate or even a 44-gun frigate. They, they wouldn't have a chance. So most of the Continental Navy ships, when they captured prizes, they were merchant ships, just like the same ships that privateers were out capturing. And in many ways, the Continental Navy ships and the privateers acted in a quite similar fashion. And both of them, well, you know, naval sailors and Marines, just like privateersmen, were motivated by money because you got paid a salary to be in the Continental Navy. You got a signing bonus often, and you got a cut of the profits. You got to share in about half of the proceeds from the auction of the prizes brought in. But being on a privateer, you had a much greater opportunity to catch more prizes per unit time, and there was less rigorous discipline. So a lot of people left the Navy or didn't go to the Navy in the first place and signed on to privateers. And that was a problem, draining the Navy of some of its men. But even without privateering, if there was no privateering, we wouldn't have suddenly had a Navy that was transformed into a fearsome fighting force. The Continental Congress spent about 16% of all its money on this Navy that it did create. Not having privateersmen around wouldn't have suddenly given the Continental Congress more money to spend on a Navy. And uh, you know there would have been maybe more people to fight on naval ships and maybe more ammunition and cannons would be available without the competition of privateers and privateersmen. But the entire colonies would be in worse shape because they would have missed out on all the prizes that the privateers brought in. So it's really, you have to look at it in that context. The privateers played a role because we didn't have a powerful Navy that could go toe to toe with the British on the open ocean. Now, one thing that I was a little surprised to see is that we actually started doing this before uh, we officially declared independence. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I wasn't expecting to see that. So, so how did this, how did this practice start? The American Revolution is very strange. At the beginning, it was sort of a war fought without conviction. And, and during the first uh, nine months to a year, it really was a defensive war. Because even after the battles of Lexington and Concord and the Battle of Bunker Hill and all of the bills that were aimed at clamping down on New England in general, but Massachusetts and Boston in particular, uh, the British often referred to Boston as the metropolis of sedition. And so even though that Britain was taking a number of steps that were really hurting the Americans and they were killing Americans, they were capturing American ships, the Continental Congress and the leaders still held out hope that there was a possibility for peace with Great Britain. And during the first six or seven months of the quote unquote undeclared war, the uh, Continental Congress still held on to this fiction that it was Parliament that was waging war against the colonies, not their beloved King George III. And that lasted until the beginning of uh, 1776, because King George started issuing more statements that made it clear that he didn't like what the colonists were doing, that we needed to beat them uh, with any means possible, put them in their place. And along with that, there were more severe laws that were put into place like the Prohibitory Act toward the end of 1775. It basically cut off all trade between Great Britain and the colonies and the colonies with any of Great Britain's other colonies. And uh, more making the Americans even more angry it gave official permission for Royal Navy ships to impress American sailors onto their ships, basically take Americans off American ships and force them to be in the Royal Navy. 
So by the beginning of 1776, and certainly by March and April and May, the Continental Congress was coming to the conclusion that uh, King George was against them as much as Parliament, and there was really only one alternative, which was to declare independence. But before declaring independence on July in July of 1776, well before that, in the summer of 1775, the Continental Congress sent out a circular to all the colonies that basically urged them to protect themselves on the ocean from the depredations of the British, you know, to establish in effect state navies or colony navies. And that's when Massachusetts got the first idea to start with privateering. And because uh, they had been well versed in privateering during the Seven Years War or the French and Indian War. And on November 1st, uh, Massachusetts passed the first privateering law in uh, what was later be the United States. And then Rhode Island and New Hampshire followed suit in early 1776. And then on March 23rd, 1776, the Continental Congress, after getting a lot of pressure from people throughout the colonies, established a America-wide privateering program. And from that point forward, it was the Continental Congress that sent out blank letters of mark to the colonies and the colonies in turn would issue those letters of mark to specific vessels to become privateers. And uh, away they went. And then by the time the, uh, the Declaration of Independence rolled around, there are, there are already hundreds uh, or certainly dozens and scores of privateers who are prowling the oceans. And from that point forward, there was sort of a frenzy for privateering in the colonies. And uh, that's, how, that's how it all started. So yeah, a lot, a lot of the fighting and uh, a lot of the actions taken on the ocean, because it wasn't only privateering that was launched before the Declaration of Independence. It was way back on October 13th of 1775 when the Continental Navy was established. And even before that, General George Washington in Boston created what some people refer to as his secret Navy without telling the Continental Congress. He finally uh, hired some ships in effect. Hey guys, Kevin here. I wanted to share with you a new development with the podcast. It is coming to you from a new podcast hosting service, Anchor.fm. So far, I'm really impressed. I really like it. Uh, number one, it's free which is always great. It's also integrated with Spotify and offers some great analytics on who's listening. Helps me gain some insight into what content would be good for the audience. And you can also record from your phone, which is a nice new feature that I'm using right now. So if you have a podcast or you're interested in starting one, download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. It's kind of interesting, George Washington's take on this. Uh, you know, being that he's an army guy, what what did he think about the idea of privateers in a navy? Well, it's sort of complicated because, as I mentioned, George Washington established his own little secret navy, and he referred to them as privateers and privateersmen, even though they weren't. They didn't have letters of mark. They were they were paid by the army. It was a different kind of setup. But he had continual problems with these mariners that uh, populated his little uh, navy. He found them to be uh, money grubbing, uh, obstreperous, you know, fighting all the time, difficult to control. He didn't have a lot of maritime background, but he, he knew how important maritime uh, supremacy was. At first, he didn't want to go to sea at all because he didn't think that we could do anything against the British who are the lords of the ocean. But he was finally convinced that, yes, we could uh, cause them some problems and uh, maybe in the process get ourselves some ammunition and guns. But he had a lot of problems with his, quote unquote, privateers. And uh, that actually in the history books causes a lot of confusion to readers because a lot of people think that Washington's secret Navy, that they were privateers. They most absolutely were not. They were a different class or different breed of, uh, of animals, so to speak. But later on in the war, uh, George Washington actually invested in a privateer. He wasn't a big fan of privateering, uh, 
because he, he felt that there was too much of an emphasis on profits and they were not under direct control of the government or, or skilled generals such as himself. However, he realized their importance. And he also was smart enough to realize that nobody, not even his army soldiers, uh, were doing things for purely patriotic reasons or Republican virtues, civic virtue. And he, there are a number of quotes I have in the book from him where he basically says that nobody can maintain a war more than a short period of time relying on patriotism alone. There needs to be the promise of a reward, some financial compensation. And he saw that firsthand with his soldiers because uh, although initially the 20,000 militia that showed up around Boston after the battle of after the battles of Lexington and Concord were burning with patriotic fervor to strike back against the British, that fervor was hard to maintain throughout the course of the war. And a lot of soldiers complained mightily about not being paid, not being paid enough. Uh, the content of the Congress had to continually promise to pay them, offer them land to keep any semblance of a fighting force. Uh, so well, really- Families to feed and all that stuff back yeah, home. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, nobody, I think, unfortunately, a lot of the elites, or at least some of the generals, uh, had a relied a little bit too he too heavily on Republican ideology of you know civil virtue winning out above all and people doing things for only noble reasons, because if they just look beneath them, most of the people doing the fighting were the average Joes in the colonies, the people who couldn't afford to fight just for principle, they also needed to get paid. And as you said, they had families at home. So I have a rather extensive part of the book because it always fascinated me when you read histories of the American Revolution, a lot of times the people who fought in it are uh, portrayed as larger than life. And uh, somehow they were imbued with patriotic impulses and they were fighting the good fight well, when it comes down to it, yes, many of them were, and many privateers as well were patriotic, but the entire war began over a, a, a conflict regarding trade and navigation and money. I mean, just as the war was about rights and, uh, uh, you know, representation, taxation, you know, no, rep, no taxation without representation, the war was also about pounds, shillings, and pence, and dollars. <laughs> so I think people often lose sight of that when they, want, when they lionize those who fought in the American Revolution and don't really understand that they were humans like the rest of us, and we have multiple motivations. So who were the kind of people who signed up for this? Um, you know, you mentioned a little bit, you know, they're they are patriotic, yes, but they also are uh, profit-seeking. Um, so yeah. what type of person, you know, would hear the call for uh, to sign up as a privateer and would want to go to sea for this? And then what was life like for them once they actually yeah. got on the boat? Yeah, the bulk of the people that signed on uh, were people that had formerly been involved in the uh, sort of merchant mariner side of the business. Uh, they were involved in commercial maritime commerce, you know, sailors, also many fishermen, because you have to remember that the British had clamped down on the colonies and a lot of the owners of those ships had their ships at the wharf or moored. And a lot of the men who formerly earned a living fishing and uh, sailing merchant vessels to various ports were suddenly out of work. So privateering offered an opportunity of potentially gainful and quite gainful employment. So most of the people on board were in their early to mid 20s. Uh, a lot of people in their late teens as well. You didn't get many in their 30s or 40s or 50s, other than the captains and maybe the, the mates. Uh, so they tended to be pretty young. They most of them had some maritime experience. However, uh, a third of the people on board, according to the Continental Congress rules and regulations on privateers, were supposed to be landsmen. People had no maritime experience. There's no way of knowing exactly how many were, but I, I think it was less, far less than a third. And that was a way to keep uh, more men available for the army and the Navy. Uh, but anyway, so 
there were some greenhorns on board, landsmen as they were called, who uh, their first couple of weeks on board a privateer must have been a rather horrific experience having to overcome their seasickness, get their sea legs and learn the names of all the ropes and sails and, and uh, parts of the ship so they could effectively help sail it. And then once they got to sea, like anybody who went to sea at this time, no matter if you were in a Navy, a merchant ship, a fishing vessel, uh, it was pretty miserable. Uh, a lot of these privateers had 50, 100 men or more on board, and they could also, they, they would often be crammed onto a, a vessel that was only 70 or 80 feet long or 50 feet long. Uh, there weren't too many privateers that were well over 100 feet, but there were some. And when you have 100 men on board, it's uh, cramped conditions. Uh, they didn't have refrigeration on board. They uh, didn't have vacuum sealed cans. They had, uh, you know, barrels of beef that was in various states of deterioration, uh, hard tack, which were these really incredibly hard, almost wooden like biscuits that had to be soaked or gnawed on to be eaten. Uh, the water was pretty bad, so they often brought a lot of liquor. No, no mariner of the day, whether he be a naval man, a merchant, a merchant mariner or a... Uh, a fisherman or a privateersman went to sea without a good quantity of liquor. Uh, in fact, everybody seemed to be soused during this era in America. Drinking was very, very common from morning till night, in part because uh, microbes tended to be killed off and drinking water could be more dangerous proposition. So being at sea was a, a difficult experience. Fortunately for many privateersmen, their cruises only lasted two, three, maybe four months, not multiple years like whaling vessels of a later era. And uh, it was a lot of boredom punctuated by moments of perhaps intense excitement if they came upon a ship that fought back. Many times the merchant ships they captured didn't fight back, but there were quite a few battles and some of them were extremely bloody with uh, tens of people lying dead. There was one battle in which uh, the American who observed the British ship said there was blood coming out of the scuppers. So many people have been slaughtered on the main deck that uh, the, 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 the whole deck was probably slick in blood and some of the overflow of blood was coming down the sides of the of the ship. So it's not a wonderful experience. I mean, being a writer is much more pleasant than <laughs> sitting in your sitting in your office at home. <laughs> it was a tough way to earn a living. And mm -hmm. the, the worst part of it is that a lot of privateering vessels got captured. And a lot of privateersmen were sent to British jails. And the jails in Britain, which were smaller and only kept only held a couple of thousand people during the war were bad enough, but it was really the prison ships in the colonies, mainly in New York, uh, right across from New York City in Wallabout Bay, which is on the edge of what today is Brooklyn. Uh, these old prison ships, prison hulks, they were called old uh, British warships like the Jersey, which is a 64 gun British warship were basically dismasted and moored in the mud in maybe eight or 10 feet of water and somewhere between 800 and 1200 men were prisoners on board. Most of them were American privateersmen and every day about six to 12 men died. Uh, the food was horrible, there was dysentery, there was disease ran rampant, uh, miserable, miserable experience, all the accounts we have of it. And at the end of the war on the Jersey alone, which was the largest of all the prison ships, it's estimated that 11,500 men lost their lives. Almost more than double, most likely, of all the men that were killed in the direct line of action and fighting during the war on land. So uh, deciding to be a privateer was a, a fraught decision. <laughs> Not really something we want to romanticize too much. No, not at all. Uh, Although some of them, you know, some of them were, were I view them as rather heroic in their own way, but the actual task of privateering, uh, no, it wasn't romantic. We have a problem in America, maybe it's the world over, but Americans tend to romanticize their history 
uh, way more than they should. I mean, the number of romantic depictions of whaling are legion, the way people look back on it. People look back fondly or romantically on the era of pirates during the golden age of piracy. And as I made clear in my book, Black Flags, Blue Waters, the pirates were by and large, very miserable people. They're not the kind of people you wanna have as neighbors. And whaling was so far from being romantic. I mean, talk about a dirty, uh, miserable job going out in the seven seas for maybe up to four years at a time, pursuing one of the largest animals on the earth or, and, uh, you know, boiling their blubber into oil and smells. And it's just a horrible way to earn a living. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I don't think many of us, if we uh, if we ever went back uh, in time to the to be on these ships, I don't think we would make it for very long. Yeah, but by the same time, I I, I do want to add that I don't look down on them for it. I mean, every era of American history or world history, it's inevitable. A lot of jobs. I mean, today a lot of jobs. Many people, even people doing the job would probably look at it and say, you know, this is not the greatest job in the world. This mm -hmm. is very difficult. It's very dirty. It's smelly. It's this, that, and everything. But that still doesn't get us away from the fact that we need those jobs. Those are part of the entire economy. And uh, I'm glad that people are, are willing to do it. And I'm glad that people are often uh, proud to do it. And they should be given uh, respect for doing those jobs, not looked down upon. One last thing I, I, I kind of wanted to ask you um, of, about your book is, uh, you know, you, you have a, uh, a lot of just really interesting stories uh, in, in your book, You're a very good storyteller. And a lot of these um, uh, characters, these historical figures are, are really compelling and, and they have interesting tales to follow. What would you, what would you say is maybe your favorite privateering story that you, that you found in your research? Hmm. I don't know. There are a couple of them, but I'm going to mention one uh, just because it's it's fascinating, not because the privateersman was so successful, but because of who he was. And that's the story of James Fortin, a, a black teenager from Philadelphia. He was unusual because he was part of a free black family in Philadelphia. His, his grandparents were uh, enslaved and his parents uh, sort of bought their freedom and he was born free. And what I find it compelling about his story is that he was about 10 or 11 years old when the Declaration of Independence was signed. And he was in Philadelphia on July 8th when the Declaration of Independence was read from the public square. And according to his family's lore and history, he actually heard that. And he heard the soaring rhetoric of the Declaration which declared that all men are equal. And he actually believed that might apply to black men perhaps. So that made him feel sort of positive towards his country to be. But then in 1780, Pennsylvania, where he was, passed the first uh, slavery abolition law in the states. It was only a gradual abolition of slavery law. Uh, current slaves or enslaved people were not freed, but their children would be freed when they turned 28. So it was slow, but it was something. And those two things uh, helped James Fortin decide that he wanted to fight for his country. And he uh, decided to be a privateersman. He was only 14 or 15, roughly, when he joined the Royal Lewis privateer out of Philadelphia, captained by Stephen Decatur. And the first cruise was very successful. He captured seven prizes and came back to Philadelphia where there were a lot of, uh, you know, cheering on the, on the docks when these people came back. Louis Fortin, uh, I mean, you know, if James Fortin was a, uh, he was what they call at the time a powder monkey. So he basically brought, brought gunpowder from the magazine to the cannons so that they could fire the cannons. And during his first cruise, a cannonball came through the, uh, place that he was providing the, the 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 cannon crew that he was helping out and according to his own account all the other men were killed and he survived so he decided to go out again on the royal lewis and he shouldn't have been so eager although he wouldn't have known that in advance 
because a few days after the Royal Lewis took its left port on its second cruise, it was captured by the HMS Amphion, Captain John Baisley. And Fortin became quite worried because he knew, and this was in fact true, that uh, people of his complexion, black men and women who were captured by British ships, almost always were sent to the slave marts in the Caribbean and sold onto the sugar plantations. So he thought that that might be his fate. But fortunately for him, Captain Baisley had a 12 year old son on board who needed a companion and he picked Fortin. And Fortin did such a good job over the next few weeks that when the Amphion pulled into New York City and all the men on the Royal Lewis were gonna be transferred to the Jersey prison ship, he gave Fortin a choice and he said, you can either be transported like the rest of the men from the Royal Lewis onto the Jersey prison ship, which is uh, just a miserable experience, or you can be the ward of my son and you can go back to England and you'll have money and you'll be educated and you'll be free the rest of your life. How about that? And Fortin decided that he was a true patriot and he turned down the deal. And he said, no, I cannot do that to my country. And he went onto the Jersey and he lasted amazingly for eight months before he was part of a prisoner exchange. And after the revolution, he became a rich man. He, he was the largest sail maker in Philadelphia when he died in the early 18 teens. He had a net value of $70,000. Uh, and he was a well-known sail maker, but he also never lost his desire to help his fellow uh, black men and women. And he was very active in efforts to make the country live up to its founding ideals of equality. And he actually was one of the first people to fund his friend, William Lloyd Garrison's new abolition newspaper, The Liberator. So I just find James Fortin a fascinating character. And there have been a couple of books written about him. They don't spend too much time on his privateering experience, but just a fascinating character. And there are, there are other people in the book, like uh, uh, John Harridan, who was a privateer out of Salem, who had an illustrious career. And I guarantee that anybody who reads the book is not going to recognize any of the names of any of the privateersmen, because there hasn't been a whole lot written about them in maritime or revolutionary histories, naval histories. And they're not everyday names like John Paul Jones, for example. So. I think there are a lot of good characters in the book, and I only wish that some of the privateersmen had sat down and written their memoirs. We'd have richer material to draw upon. Sure. Well, that is a uh, was a really good story to end on. I I I like that story uh, a lot. Um, yeah. Well, if people uh, like this topic and they want to hear more uh, privateering stories and learn more about how uh these uh brave men contributed to uh the founding of our country uh where can they go to get a copy of the book or to learn more about you and uh you know some of your other um other projects okay well the book should be available at any bookstore you know brick and mortar store online if they don't have it right away they can certainly order it uh but to find out more about me and my books and also to read the introduction to each of my books just go to my website, which is my full name. It's Eric J. Dolan, E-R-I-C-J-A-Y-D-O-L-I-N, not A-N, dot com. And there you can not only see reviews of my books and read the first chapters of the books, uh, you can also see where I'm speaking. Most of my speaking is usually in the new New England area, but I am also going out to California and I'm going down to Virginia and Mississippi and possibly Florida and New York. So uh, if anybody's listening and they want me to come talk, just convince one of your local venues or organizations to reach out to me. And uh, it's, uh, you know, I do get paid to speak, so it's not cheap especially if i have to fly someplace but i think it's worth it so <laughs> but you can go to my website if anybody wants to bring you to ohio they should do that I, yes I would love yeah to yeah I'd be happy i'd be happy to go to ohio <laughs> 
All right. Well, uh, Eric, as, as always, this has been a treat, uh, and hopefully we can have you on again sometime. Thanks. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, that, that would be great. And all the best in Ohio. And uh, until we meet again. Hey, gang. I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to hang out with me and learn a little bit about history and privateering in the American Revolution. Uh, if this was something that you found really interesting, uh, I've got a link for you uh, down in the description of this episode in your podcast app. You can pick up a copy of Eric's book, Rebels at Sea. Uh, and then also, if you're curious about uh, Eric's other appearances on the program, I uh, also got a couple links for you there where you can check out uh, his other episodes uh, when he's been on before. Uh, again, I want to say a big thank you to everyone for four awesome years of doing this podcast. Um, it's been a lot of fun, and I look forward to what's ahead uh, in the short term. Uh, I know that I have a bit of a backlog of episodes that I'm excited to um, share with you guys. So uh, very, very soon, check back. We're going to be doing a uh, history of the BBC with David Hendy. Uh, and then we're going to go uh, way further back and we're going to look at Arthurian legends uh, with an author named John Matthews. So it's going to be an exciting few weeks. I hope you guys will stick around and uh, hope I'll hear from you again soon.